Hello everyone. As part of our Better Outcomes webinar series, I'd like to thank you for joining us online today for this very special live broadcast. My name is Emily Eberly with Sachs Healthcare Communications and I'm your technical producer. It is my pleasure to welcome you to today's webinar, New Strategies in Treating Respiratory Failure, NIV and HFNO as Complementary Therapies. And now I'd like to introduce you to Kathy Short, who is our moderator today. Kathy is a respiratory therapy clinical specialist at the North Carolina J.C. Byrne Center, UNC Medical Center, located in Chapel Hill, North Carolina. Previously, she was the director of respiratory care for the Department of Pulmonary Diagnostics at the same hospital. Kathy is a member of several professional organizations, including the AARC, the Society of Critical Care Medicine, and as well, she is a board member of the North Carolina Respiratory Care Society. Kathy has published numerous articles in several peer-reviewed journals and has presented at both national and international conferences. In 2013, Kathy was inducted as a fellow into the AARC. Kathy, welcome, and I'm so glad to be working with you for this special session, and we thank you for all of your support in moderating this important webinar for so many people today. Are you ready to get started? Yes, I am. Um, good morning and good afternoon to everyone who is attending the seminar, depending on where you are in the country. Thank you, Emily, for that very kind introduction. The title of today's webinar is New Strategies in Treating Respiratory Failure, Non-Invasive Ventilation and High-Flow Nasal Therapy as Complementary Therapies. We are very fortunate to have an extremely qualified speaker today presenting on this very important topic, Dr. Nicholas Hill. Dr. Hill is a good friend and is also a professor of medicine at Tufts University School of Medicine and chief of the Pulmonary and Critical Care and Sleep Division at Tufts Medical Center in Boston, Massachusetts. His primary research interests include the role of angiogenic factors in pulmonary vascular biology, therapeutic approaches for clinical pulmonary hypertension, and evaluating ways of delivering and testing the efficacy of non-invasive ventilation. Dr. Hill has authored or co-authored more than 200 articles in peer-reviewed journals such as the American Journal of Physiology, Respiratory Medicine, and Critical Care Medicine. He is a member of the American College of Chest Physicians, American Thoracic Society, also a past president, American Association for Advancement of Science, and Pulmonary Hypertension Association. We do um, have continuing education credits for physicians. A link to obtain the CE credits will be available at the conclusion of this webinar. This activity is jointly provided by Synaptive and Sachs Healthcare Communications. The details of how to, how to apply for your accreditation or the CEs are below. Support for this educational activity is provided by Philips Healthcare. For, we also have continuing education um, contact hours for nurses and respiratory therapists. Um, it's approved, this seminar is approved for one contact hour for nurses and RTs, and the details uh, are listed below for the accreditation. Support for this educational activity, again, is provided by Philips Healthcare. We do have a few disclosures. Um, uh, that the speaker wants to make folks aware of. Um, he has received grants for research from Fisher Pay Cal. He serves on advisory boards for A Lung Technologies and Fisher Payco. And he's a consultant for Philips Respironics. At this point, um, I'd like to turn the presentation over to our speaker, Dr. Hill. Are you ready to get started, Dr. Hill? I am Kathy. Uh, thank you for that very kind introduction, and I can't think of anybody I'd rather be introduced by. Uh, and hello, everyone. Welcome to the webinar. I, I appreciate your attendance. Uh, today, we're going to talk about new strategies in treating respiratory failure uh, using non-invasive ventilation and high-flow nasal therapy as complementary therapies. Our learning objectives today are to be able to discuss the indications for non-invasive ventilation and high-flow nasal therapy, 
compare and contrast physiologic actions of non-invasive and high flow and demonstrate how high flow and non-invasive ventilation can work in a complementary fashion. We're going to start out talking about some technical considerations, then we'll deal with the physiologic effects, uh, spend some time comparing and contrasting NIV with high flow, and then uh, I'm going to talk about uh, some recent uh, research that uh, my group has just had um, accepted for publication in the Journal of Critical Care, so you're, you'll be the first to see it, um, and then we'll wind up with some practical considerations. First, uh, the technical aspects. As everyone on the call is aware, um, one of the major differences between non-invasive ventilation and high flow is that high flow is heated and humidified to body conditions. Uh, and it does so by uh, maintaining those conditions at flows up to 60 liters per minute, whereas with non-invasive ventilation, the use of heat and humidification is variable. Uh, the technological advance that enabled us to administer these flows into the nose and have them uh, tolerable for patients was this ability to, to heat and humidify the body conditions. If a dry, cool gas was blown into the nose at those flow rates, we'd rapidly become intolerant due to uh, cooling and desiccation of the nose. So uh, the, the trick is the heat and humidification that makes it tolerable. Uh, other major differences between the two include the fact that NIV is based mainly on pressure, uh, preset inspiratory and expiratory pressures, uh, and this is w when it's used in, in its usual mode, a, either pressure support plus PEEP or uh, bi-level type modes, which are in essence in the way they function uh, the same thing, whereas with high flow, uh, it's a flow set mode where the flow, once it's selected, is continuous and pressure will vary. Uh, the circuit with NIV can be single or double depending on whether you're using a bi-level type device which uses a single circuit or a critical care type ventilator which uses a double standard double circuit and with high flow it's a single heated circuit and the heating can be done by heated wires or by a water jacket depending on the manufacturer but it's important that the the uh, gas be heated because of the condensation that will happen as it cools in unheated uh, circuits. As far as oxygenation is concerned, both can deliver oxygenation at levels ranging from room air right up to 100%, and this is done using blenders. Uh, some of the older non-invasive ventilation devices used oxygen bled into the mask or the circuit, uh, but that limited the FiO2 to generally not higher than about 50%, and uh, use of those is discouraged, particularly in patients with hypoxemic respiratory failure. Now, with regard to non-invasive ventilation, uh, which has been around in cr critical care arena for about 28 years now, uh, we understand a lot about the physiologic actions, and I'm just going to briefly discuss uh, those physiologic actions in relation to the major indications for non-invasive ventilation, which are for, is for hypercapnic respiratory failure in patients with COPD exacerbations and also in patients with cardiogenic pulmonary edema. In patients with COPD exacerbations, uh, patients who are developing worsening respiratory distress, uh, the work of breathing increases. And these are patients who generally have severe airway obstruction at baseline, and they're barely compensated under the best of conditions when they get an upper respiratory infection or a pneumonia, even something that wouldn't be much uh, harm to a healthy person, 
tips them right over. Uh, they fall off the, the cliff they're sitting on, and they can get in serious trouble as they increase their respiratory rate. Uh, their amount of time spent exhaling diminishes, and they start to trap air, and they develop intrinsic PEEP. And by applying an extrinsic positive end expiratory pressure, the bilevel or pressure support plus PEEP modes counterbalance that increase in intrinsic PEEP, and they cut down on the work necessary to get air in for the next breath because uh, the patient only has to lower the intraalveolar pressure below the level of pressure in the mask as opposed to lowering it below atmospheric. So, for example, if you have an extrinsic uh, pressure of 8 centimeters of water in the mask, then all you have to do is lower the intraalveolar pressure to 7, and air will follow that gradient. Whereas if, you're on, on, uh, if you have no positive pressure, uh, in order to get <coughs> air in, you have to lower the pressure below atmospheric. Uh, so you exert considerably more effort uh, if you don't have extrinsic pressure and applying extrinsic pressure reduces the effort. Uh, the pressure support component added to the PEEP further reduces inspiratory effort in a manner that's similar to power steering, which is probably the easiest way to conceptualize it, but once air starts flowing in, you've overcome the intrinsic PEEP, then it assists you in getting more air into your lungs. And both of these have added effects on reducing work of breathing and enable patients to get up on the edge of the cliff again and avoid this downward spiral with increasing respiratory effort, development of respiratory muscle fatigue, respiratory failure, and eventually death. In cardiogenic pulmonary edema, uh, the method or the mechanism is a little bit different and relies largely on the increase in intrathoracic pressure, which helps to expand flooded alveoli, and you get a, a rapid effect in improving oxygenation and also improving compliance, which reduces work of breathing. Also, that intrathoracic pressure applies a positive pressure around uh, the pericardium and reduces transmural pressure in the heart having an afterload reducing effect so it can actually directly improve heart function. Now as, as far as high flow nasal therapy is concerned, uh, the mechanism by which it assists breathing is a little bit different. I've mentioned the importance of heat and humidification and the uh, this may it, this clearly enhances the comfort and tolerance compared to a dry gas but in studies that have compared it to standard high flow oxygen like N NRB masks, it's also sensed as m more comfort and it's considerably more comfortable than a strapped on tight fitting non-invasive ventilation mask. And you can see an example of what the prongs look like. Uh, they're loose fitting, they're compliant, and uh, they're uh, very well tolerated by patients. Uh, and also the fact that they permit unimpeded speaking and eating is a big plus for patients. Uh, in the photo below, uh, Butterball the cat, at least to me, does not look too happy with, with a standard mask. Now, with high flow, the physiologic effects, as I said, are different, and there are a number of them. One of the first things that people thought would be helped by high flow is uh, the removal of secretions, and this has been shown in, in a number of studies, uh, partly related to improved hydration and thus reduced viscosity of secretions, but also because the uh, heating and humidification to body conditions helps to preserve mucociliary function. There's actually some evidence that uh, the rate of pulmonary infections can be reduced when patients use high flow. High flow is also an effective oxygenator, and it does so via two basic mechanisms. One is because it delivers flow up to 60 liters per minute, it helps to keep up with the inspiratory flow rate demands of dyspneic patients, which can go up to 60 or sometimes even higher liters per minute in inspiratory flow rate. 
when someone is on a standard not NRB, non-rebreather mask, where the flow rates are generally adjusted up to perhaps 15 liters per minute, there's a lot of entrainment of room air and dilution of the FiO2 so that the delivery is, is not as reliable. Uh, by keeping up with the inspiratory flow rate, high flow reduces entrainment of room air and the FiO2 is maintained more reliably. Also, uh, there is the washout, the flushing effect in the nasopharynx so that when the patient initiates their next inspiration, rather than having to draw in from the anatomic dead space, the gas that has just been exhaled, much of that gas has been replaced by the gas from the high flow and so the initial bolus of air during inspiration has that high flow adjusted FiO2 and that also helps to maintain better uh, delivery of the targeted FiO2. That flushing out effect reduces the dead space and that improves ventilatory efficiency so for patients with hypercapnic respiratory failure the ventilatory demands are reduced. There's also a positive end expiratory pressure, which is related to the flow throughout the respiratory cycle of, um, of the high flows going into the nasopharynx. And when patients are exhaling, that creates an impedance that increase, it increases the pressure. And uh, there's also some evidence that this will increase end expiratory lung volume, which helps distribution of gas within the lung uh, and can help to open up some of alveoli that otherwise would collapse and this can also potentially con contribute to some reduction in worth, work of breathing uh, as well as, as uh, improved uh, oxygenation. There's also a consistent effect in most studies on decreasing respiratory rate and this has an important effect on work of breathing. Even if you don't reduce the work of breathing with each breath, if you reduce the respiratory rate, the work of breathing per minute goes down and uh, patients don't need to work as hard and this can help stabilize them. Now to il illustrate some of these mechanisms, here we have a, a diagram uh, or a figure uh, that was developed by placing gas in a human plastic model of the upper airway and the red is the gas and what we're looking at here is um, different flow rates, no flow on the left, uh, 15, 30 and 45 liters per minute uh, on the right. And you'll see at the higher flow rates the flushing is quicker um, and it takes less than a second to get rid of much of that dead space. So th that's an illustration of how uh, the flushing of dead space can eliminate CO2 uh, without requiring any work from the patient. Now I did mention uh, the respiratory rate reducing effect and this illustrated in this uh, figure from a study by Roca that compared 30 minutes of standard face mass oxygen on the left to what happens to respiratory rate uh, with high flow on the right and you can see that in virtually every patient, it looks like there's maybe one exception or a couple of exceptions, but in almost every patient there is a consistent and substantial reduction in respiratory rate which is highly statistically significant and this contributes to reduction in work of breathing as, as I was stating. Now the end expiratory pressure contour looks like what we see in this figure uh, which was obtained from a patient receiving 60 liters per minute of high flow and the blue tracing is taken from a pressure transducer placed in the uh, posterior nasopharynx uh, in someone re receiving that 60 liters per minute and during expiration you can see they arrive at a peak and then it tapers off as, as exhalation continues and the expiratory flow drops off and then during inspiration it goes negative. And this is contrasted with somebody on standard oxygen where uh, there's a little bit of positive pressure during expiration that then when flow stops goes down to zero and goes negative during inspiration. Now 
there are a number of studies that we're seeing uh, recently that have suggested that high flow might work as well as non-invasive ventilation uh, for a number of indications. And I show this slide to show to demonstrate that there are significant differences in the way that non-invasive ventilation and high flow work, which means that depending on the indication, uh, one might be preferred to the other. Uh, and it's not uh, fair to say that they achieve essentially the same end. And what I'm illustrating here in a figure that was drawn by one of my sisters, who's a medical illustrator, um, if you are on non-invasive ventilation by level set at 12 over 6, during inspiration, the pressure goes up to the set 12, and then during expiration, it drops off and goes to the expiratory set pressure, which in this case is six, and it fluctuates up and down. And so during inspiration, you get a positive pressure, and this is one of the things, the power steering effect, that reduces work of breathing. In contrast, during high flow, as I showed you in that previous figure, and this, this is actually drawn from that figure, you have an initial peak when you first start to exhale and, and the flow rates are highest, and then it tapers off during expiration uh, and then during inspiration it dips down. So during expiration the pressures it are because of the way they're set are relatively the same here but during inspiration there's a big difference. A substantial positive swing in pressure to assist inhalation a, a, a negative swing in pressure it still remains positive but it's much less than with non-invasive ventilation and, and in patients who have exacerbations of COPD for example or cardiogenic pulmonary edema those positive pressures may be very important in reducing work of breathing, and so non-invasive ventilation would still be considered the, the modality of choice, first choice for those kinds of patients. Now, there's been a lot of interest in using high flow for patients with hypoxemic respiratory failure. Uh, there are a number of studies in the literature uh, that have shown in general pretty favorable results in terms of its tolerability, its comfort, its reliability in oxygenating. Um, I want to show you one study that was published in the New England Journal three years ago now uh, that was a very well done randomized controlled trial comparing high flow to non-invasive and to standard oxygen uh, in patients who had to have a a PA to FiO2 ratio of less than or equal to 300, thus they qualified for at least mild ARDS, so fairly severely hypoxemic. They had to be tachypnic with respiratory rates greater than 25. They had to have no hypercapnia, so these were patients with, with pure hypoxemic respiratory failure, and they could have no chronic respiratory failure in their history. 2,500 patients in France and Belgium in, in a, a multi-center ICU trial uh, were screened for their acute hypoxemic respiratory failure, and uh, 500 were eligible, and just over 300 were enrolled and equally distributed between the three groups. The initial settings for non-rebreather mask, which was the standard oxygen group, it was set at greater than or equal to 10 liters per minute and adjusted to try to maintain adequate oxygenation. The high flow was at 50 liters per minute starting off and an FiO2 of 100%. Uh, and the actual FiO2 that they ended up with was 82%. For non-invasive ventilation, they used a target tidal volume of 7 to 10 mLs per kilogram. And the actual pressure support they ended up with was 8 with a PEEP of 5 and an FiO2 of 67% on average. And it's important to note that NIV was used on an average of eight hours daily for the first two days in these patients. So in actual fact, most of the time they were, on, they were not on NIV and between sessions of NIV they were actually treated with nasal high flow. So it, 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 for the first two days they got eight hours of NIV and 16 hours of nasal high flow. The results of this study showed that uh, the intubation rate, which was the major outcome variable uh, amongst all patients 
showed a strong ten, trend toward lower rates in patients on high flow, but it was not statistically significant. So technically speaking, this study was negative. However, there were some interesting findings in some of the secondary outcomes. First of all, if they just selected people with more severe hypoxemia, i.e. PF ratios less than 200, there was a statistically significant reduction in the intubation rate in the high flow compared to standard oxygen or NIV where the intubation rate was actually 58 percent down to 35. There were more ventilator free days in the high flow and most strikingly there was a higher death rate in the ICU and after 90 days and at 90 days this is substantial 50 percent in NIV and about the same in standard oxygen down to 30 percent so a really striking difference and here's the Kaplan-Meier curve showing these differences in uh, the probability of survival over this, the study. So survival was obviously substantially higher going out to 90 degree days in the high flow compared to standard oxygen or NIV. Um, but as with any study, even, even studies published in the New England Journal, there are also there are always some concerns. And in this study, uh, one concern is that the major outcome variable was not statistically significant as I pointed out and we were really looking at subgroup uh, analyses and uh, secondary outcomes that showed the differences and as I pointed out most of the time the patients were spending even those in the NIV group on nasal high flow and it was just eight hours of non-invasive ventilation that contributed to this large difference in mortality uh, and the question comes up, how do you explain the mortality difference? Well, the authors suggested that perhaps it was because the average tidal volume in the non-invasive ventilation group was 9.2 milliliters per kilogram, which is, of course, substantially larger than the 6 milliliters of kil per kilogram that was found in the ARMA trial on an intubated patient uh, to be the safer tidal volume compared to 12. And 9.2 might be enough to cause some ventilator-induced lung injury and lead to worse outcomes. However, uh, it's important to note that they actually targeted those pressures. They targeted 7 to 10 milliliters per kilogram. So you could also almost say that they set up the study for failure in that regard. There was also more refractory shock that was responsible for the mortalities. And in the NIV group, that was 17%. In the high flow, it was 6%. And the authors posited that this was because they had reduced the intubation rate and therefore uh, less pneumonia and shock. But it, in fact, the intubation rate was not statistically significant overall. And there may have been a randomization problem here. It's also impossible to blind these kinds of studies. So there's always possible inherent bias. And this study needs to be re replicated although it certainly has uh, increased uh, the use of high flow in hypoxemic patients with pneumonia and ARDS, which is what most of these patients had. It was certainly a well-done study, uh, but we are, we are waiting uh, replication with, with other studies that are underway presently. Another application of uh, high flow that has been studied in a large uh, randomized controlled trial uh, is in the post-operative setting and in this particular study post-cardiac surgery and they identified patients in the study who had uh, hypoxemia with a PF ratio less than 300 to kipnic accessory muscle use some evidence that they they were at, at least mild hypoxic respiratory failure uh, the patients were excluded if they had a BMI greater than 30 or an LV ejection fraction less than 40%. Uh, the high flow was started at 50 liters per minute and the FiO2 was 50%. Uh, and in the non-invasive ventilation group, they used a BiPAP of eight centimeters of water IPAP and four EPAP for at least four hours daily. Uh, and their major outcome variable was treatment failure failure which they defined as reintubation or early discontinuation and at baseline the average patient had a respiratory rate of 33 a PF ratio of 200 
and no hypercapnia. Um, so it was a moderately ill population. And what they found was there was no difference in over 400 patients in each group between high flow and BiPAP with regard to respiratory rate, reintubation rate, which was virtually superimposable. And they did have crossovers in this study. If people failed one, they could go into the other. And that was at a rate of approximately 10%, not much difference between them. The PF ratio uh, and I'm, was significantly different. And I point this out, in, because of the higher pressures you get with the bi-level, um, the, there was actually a significantly better PF ratio in the non-invasive ventilation group with the high flow group. High flow does better than standard oxygen, but Again, because of the, the higher pressures you can achieve with uh, bi-level or CPAP, the, you can achieve better PF ratios. Another significant difference worth pointing out is the hours of use per day. With BiPAP, it was 6.5. With high flow, it was 20. And this underlines the greater tolerability of high flow. Patients will use high flow 24-7 for multiple days uh, on end, and uh, it's very difficult to do that with BiPAP because people simply don't tolerate it nearly as well. Uh, there have been a number of studies looking at the post-extubation patients. What we just looked at in the previous was post-surgical post-extubation, but this is patients who come in with respiratory failure and then get extubated um, uh, using standard extubation criteria. And the first study to look at th uh, this group was uh, Maggiore in the Blue Journal, 105 patients, and they found a reduction in the reintubation rate from 21% down to 4% in this group of patients selected because they uh, had hypoxemic respiratory failure. Then uh, Hernandez published two articles, one on what they termed the low-risk group of 440 patients, and they compared high flow to standard oxygen, and they found a significant reduction in reintubations to 5% with high flow from 12% from with standard oxygen. Uh, I think it's fair to say that this was not a real low-risk group because 12% as a post-extubation uh, reintubation rate uh, I would say is is more in the, the moderate usual uh, rate that we would expect. Um, and uh, many of these patients were post-operative or had uh, neurosurgical problems and probably the humidification and secretion mobilization properties of high flow uh, was responsible for this difference. Uh, the next study they did was on high-risk post-extubation patients and these patients did Get, ended up getting intubated more often, uh, there was no difference between high flow and non-invasive ventilation with regard to reintubations in, in this study, and the authors concluded that high flow was not inferior to uh, non-invasive ventilation, which was also the conclusion in the previous study I showed you in the post-cardiac surgery group. High flow also has been finding a niche in patients with do not intubate status who are in respiratory failure and, and dyspneic, um, mainly because it's better tolerated. And, and one study uh, looking at this group, 183 patients with advanced stage lung cancer and dyspnea and hypoxemia at Sloan Kettering, uh, showed greater comfort than standard high oxygen flow therapy. Uh, the unimpeded speaking and eating was a a big plus and 85% tolerated and or improved uh, or remained stable um, on high flow and that tolerance part is something we generally would not see in non-invasive ventilation in this group. It's, it's sometimes very difficult to keep these people comfortable if uh, we're trying to treat them with, with uh, non-invasive. Um, I did make some comments about uh, being careful about concluding non-inferiority between uh, high flow and uh, non-invasive ventilation. And uh, this is a, a study with reasonable numbers that was published in the Annals of Emergency Medicine last year. And it was using uh, a form of high flow that the manufacturer calls high-velocity nasal insufflation. Uh, 
and the idea here is that these prongs are have a, a narrower bore than uh, prongs uh, available from other manufacturers, and so the air comes out at a higher velocity. Uh, the total flow is up to 40 liters per minute with this device, but with the high velocity, um, the feeling is that uh, there are more eddies formed in the nasopharynx, and you still get a good uh, flushing effect and reduction in uh, in dead space. This is something that that has not been subjected to direct comparisons between different devices, uh, so. Uh, it, 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 so it, I would characterize it as a form of, of high flow, uh, and in this particular study, um, it um, was used in patients admitted to emergency uh, departments with respiratory failure. Uh, patients had to be more than 18 years old, have a need for non-invasive ventilation, and uh, patients with drug ODs, uh, cardiovascular arrests, secretion problems, uncooperative were excluded, and a, a variety of different etiologies were included in the study, including 25% with COPD exacerbations, hypercapnic respiratory failure, 21% with cardiogenic pulmonary edema, and 30% with uh, hypoxemic respiratory failure and pneumonia. Uh, they were started out on 30 liters per minute with the high velocity device. The average FiO2 was 62%, the temp was 35. When they were started on non invasive ventilation, the average pressures were 13 over 5. There were just about 100 patients in each group. And at baseline, the respiratory rates were moderately high, not severe. At around 30, uh, the O2 sats were in the low 90s on supplemental O2 and the average PCO2s were somewhat elevated, not statistically significant different. The major outcome uh, variable was therapy failure, which included the need to terminate or to cross over therapy. And the crossover was included here because it's very hard to enroll patients in these kinds of studies if you don't offer patients the ability to cross over to the other therapy. And this is because a lot of the practitioners don't want their patients going into a trial unless they can try both therapies before they get intubated. So you get into high flow, uh, you, you're not responding as well as, as the clinicians would like. Um, if you don't need an immediate intubation, then you could try non-invasive ventilation. And that was actually done in 23 patients in the high flow. In the non-invasive group, uh, that could uh, cross over to high flow. There were six who did that. Uh, there was a bit of imbalance in the intubations, more intubations in NIV than in uh, high flow. However, considering that 23 of the patients in the high flow group were cross over to non-invasive ventilation and only three required intubation, 20 did not, uh, there's a problem in interpretation because we don't know what would have happened to those 20 patients if they had been left on high flow. Many of them presumably would have been intubated. So is it that non-invasive ventilation was able to prevent a lot of those intubations and yet in an intention to treat analysis that gets kept in the high flow column? Um, so with regard to non-inferiority, um, which was the conclusion in this study, you, you've got to be careful because there are a, a number of different categories of diagnosis, and it's possible that the benefit of something like NIV and COPD exacerbations, for example, might get diluted out because the high flow worked better in the uh, pneumonia, hypoxic respiratory failure group. Um, there are patients with COPD and cardiogenic pulmonary edema who need those high pressures sometimes with high flow, I mean uh, with NIV, and it would be um, important to, to keep in mind that COPD and, and cardiogenic pulmonary edema are still considered the best recipients for non-invasive ventilation. The clinical applications thus, uh, that we've gone over uh, that are supported by evidence but as of yet, uh, the guidelines haven't uh, gotten to them. Our hypoxemic respiratory failure that we went over post-operative, post-extubation, 
do not intubate, uh, humidification of secretions. And I didn't talk about this, but there's a literature on pre-oxygenation before uh, intubation and use during endoscopy. We're actually using high flow routinely for our bronchoscopies now. And I would say right now we have insufficient evidence to say that high flow should be used either at the same level as NIV, and certainly we don't have evidence to say that, that they're superior to NIV for acute pulmonary edema or hypercaptic respiratory failure. So NIV remains the modality of, of choice for those entities. So I, I want to quickly go through the, uh, the study that I mentioned to you, which was predicated on the idea that non-invasive ventilation is difficult to tolerate, but there are situations where you want to be able to use non-invasive, and uh, high flow could be used to extend the breaks and to make people more comfortable, less dystonic than standard oxygen during those breaks. And standard oxygen, of course, is what uh, is considered standard care. And in our study, um, we enrolled a total of 54 patients of a planned 70. Uh, we used either the, the Vision or V60 ventilator, uh, targeted 6 to 8 milliliters per kilogram. The high flow uh, was using the, the fischer peichel uh, humidifier at 35 liters a minute, and the FiO2 adjusted for uh, a target oxygenation of 82%. Um, we ended up with, with just over 20 patients in each group. Uh, there was a little mismatching in the, the initial uh, baseline, including a somewhat higher BMI in the, 30, in the um, standard oxygen. Apache scores were nearly identical. Respiratory rates were the same, but heart rate was a little slower in standard oxygen, and there was more obstructive sleep apnea, standard oxygen, more ARDS, and high flow. So the high flow group may have been a little sicker, um, our main outcome variable was the amount of time on non-invasive ventilation, which we hypothesized would be less if we used high flow in a complementary fraction uh, compared to standard oxygen, but it was actually about the same. But breaks tended to be a little bit longer with the high flow. But the most important thing was that during breaks, uh, there was a, a greater tendency for respiratory rate to go up with standard oxygen and less so with high flow. Dyspnea also tended to be, get worse during breaks, stayed steady during use of high flow, and comfort was greater with high flow than with standard oxygen. So uh, we also showed that there was less eye irritation, a tendency toward less nasal discomfort, and less difficulty breathing compared to standard oxygen. Um, so there were a number of advantages uh, to using high flow, and we concluded that it was uh, an attractive alternative to standard oxygen during, during breaks. So what flow to use uh, to start off? Uh, I would, if you're going to use high flow, use high flow. And we generally start with 50 liters a minute, which is well tolerated. Um, in the study, we started out with 35, and patients never got over an average of 38. So what happens is you tend not to adjust it a whole lot, and if you want to take advantage of the higher flows, you start with 50. Uh, with heat, some patients find 37 degrees too hot, and uh, on average, we end up at about 34. And the FiO2 is adjusted to whatever target, but it's important to keep in mind that uh, the FiO2 is adjustable right down the room air, and in some patients, we keep the FiO2 relatively low because we don't want to run into a problem with excessive oxygenation. Uh, I, I would guess we'll have a question dealing with weaning, so I'm just going to skip over that. And to summarize, um, high flow is effective for hypoxemic respiratory failure related to pneumonia, ARDS, but we need more data on that. Uh, so that the FRAT study gets replicated. Um, it has a role in hypoxemic patients post-extubation, post-cardiac surgery, uh, and it's not inferior to non-invasive ventilation in, in those settings. Uh, it may be useful for do not intubate patients, and by virtue of, of its greater comfort, less dyspnea, and less increase in respiratory rate, it, it is an attractive alternative to standard oxygen for breaks from NIV. And I would 
keep in mind that until further notice, the use of, of uh, high flow as opposed to NIV for patients with hypercapnic uh, respiratory failure and COPD patients and cardiogenic pulmonary edema, uh, NIV is still the preferred mode in those patients, but you can use non-invasive ventilation in the complementary fashion uh, I've outlined. So I'm going to stop there, and uh, I would like to entertain questions. I understand that there, a number of them are piling up. Thank you very much, and I'm going to turn it back over to Kathy. Thank you, Dr. Hill, uh, for a very informative um, presentation. That was fantastic. Um, like you said, we've received numerous questions from the audience. Uh, however, uh, before we get to those questions, I'd like to remind folks of how to obtain your CEUs. Uh, this education, um, educational activity is approved for one contact hour to obtain your CE credits. Go to SACS, S-A-X-E, testing dot com forward slash bo you will need to register at the site complete the evaluation and, um, and upon successful completion you will be able to print your certificate of completion again support for this educational activity is provided by Philips Healthcare so um, without further ado um, we do have um, quite a few questions uh, this question is from Christina, and she asks, how does COPD in a patient or client affect the use of high-flow nasal therapy? I see NIV used most often to bridge a patient or client to avoid intubation. What are your thoughts, Dr. Hill? Yeah, that's a very important question, and I tr tried to uh, convey my firm belief that Non-invasive ventilation is the preferred mode in patients who have more severe exacerbations of COPD because their work of breathing tends to be high and they need the, the expiratory pressure to counterbalance autopeep and the higher inspiratory pressure to get that, that uh, power steering effect, the assistance of, of uh, inhalation once you overcome autopeep. Now, having said that, uh, high flow can have a number of different roles in treating patients with hypercapnic respiratory failure. Uh, one is there are a lot of people who, are, who don't tolerate non-invasive ventilation and um, it, it might be worth considering in people with milder to moderate uh, exacerbations. In general, if it's a mild exacerbation, I'm going to go with, with just oxygen, standard oxygen supplementation, and they generally don't need ventilatory uh, assistance. But in moderate patients, um, high flow may be useful. It does reduce dead space and reduces ventilatory demands, and so patients don't have to ventilate as much to get rid of CO2, and that may be sufficient to stabilize uh, such patients. Also, uh, as I just illustrated, there is the potential for a complementary use. Uh, in fact, I'm working in an ICU today and we're doing just that in, in uh, one of our patients who, who came in yesterday because he's not tolerating the non-invasive ventilation well, but if we are using high flow for anywhere from 30 minutes to 45 minutes as tolerated, then we put the, the mask back on and uh, the, the uh, non-invasive ventilation back on and uh, what's, what's happening is he, he gets um, a little more tachypnic, he, he's working harder on the high flow, we put him back on non-invasive ventilation for a couple of hours is tolerated, he can't tolerate it any, anymore, we put him back on the high flow. So we're using what the Europeans have called sequential use of of non-invasive ventilation and, and high flow to try to keep him stable. But the trick is you got to watch him real close when he's not on non-invasive ventilation. As he gets better, as his work of breathing comes down, then we transition him more to high flow and, and eventually to just standard nasal oxygen. Uh, but in patients with severe exacerbations, I would be real careful 
because uh, the high flow is probably not going to be able to uh, reduce the work of breathing enough and I wouldn't put off a needed intubation uh, and, and try to persist with high flow in a patient like that if, it, if it, things aren't uh, responding adequately. Thank you. Um, Paul asks, if I recall correctly from the FRAT study, they excluded COPD patients, but the majority of the patients did have PNA. Since other studies have shown that patients with PNA don't do very well with NIV, I wonder what the comparison would look like if both COPD and PNA patients were excluded. Any comment on that? What? Well, it's, it's true they excluded COPD. They wanted to look at hypoxemic respiratory failure. They excluded anybody with a PCO2 over 45. Um, I think the last part of that question was what would happen if they excluded the PNA. And PNA, by the way, they're talking about pneumonia yes. uh, patients. Um, if they excluded the pneumonia patients, they would have virtually no patients left in the study because 75% 75, <laughs> 75 of them had pneumonia. But that was the target population. Now, uh, I'm glad you asked that question because it brings up a couple of important points. One is, uh, and I think this was in the question, traditionally non-invasive ventilation has not done real well with hypoxemic respiratory failure. And a lot of that has to do with the difficulty with tolerance. In general, these are people who, by virtue of their hypoxemia, need higher pressures, particularly expiratory pressures, to try to keep the PO2 up there and get a better PF ratio. When you do that with non-invasive ventilation, you add to intolerance because you've got to strap uh, the mask on tighter, becomes uncomfortable, yes. patients are leaking, it's hard to get them to synchronize, mm -hmm. and so uh, patients then become intolerant. Also, you got to watch it in patients who are getting hypoxemic respiratory failure because they're septic because they can start to develop a deterioration with progressive multi-organ system dysfunction and when I see that start happening I run for my endotracheal tube. I don't mess with any of these non-invasive <laughs> things. And the default mode in hypoxemic respiratory failure today should still be endotracheal intubation we should not be relying on any kind of non-invasive thing beyond a certain point. But the thing about high flow is because it's better tolerated, people can use it 24-7 as opposed to, you know, in, in the FRAT study, eight hours a day, maybe you can get more than that in some patients. But on average, people just aren't going to tolerate it as well. And something that people can tolerate is probably better than something that people can't tolerate. So that's maybe why a high flow looks better. But, but either way, uh, you have to be really careful when you're using non-invasive techniques in these patients. Be ready to intubate earlier than later. Correct. Okay, the next question is um, from Randall. Approximately how much dead space is in the upper airway and is such uh, different in a non-distressed versus a distressed patient. The second part of the question is, even though Butterball the cat didn't have the <laughs> standard mask, did it help her? <laughs> um, okay, we'll get to that one. Uh, so um, the dead, uh, that's another excellent question, and um, the anatomic dead space, which is the non-gassing exchanging parts of, of your airways, mainly its upper airway, and um, your nasopharynx, oropharynx, um, is equivalent. This is something uh, all medical st students learn in their first year uh, to roughly one milliliter per pound. Uh, so in, in this day when we have an obesity ep epidemic, it's actually your ideal body weight that we should be looking at. Uh, so if you take your usual, uh, you know, 150-pound individual, 200-pound more or less normal uh, body morphography, it's going to be 150 to 200 mLs uh, per in, in most people. Women will have a little less than men because they're a little smaller on average, um, but but that's the range. Let's say 150 cc's. Uh, now, the high flow doesn't clear the whole dead space out, but perhaps it's, it's anywhere from 50 to 75 cc's. But if you 
look at this on a per breath base, basis. Over time, it adds up a lot. Let's say you're breathing at uh, a rate of, of 20 per minute. Um, so that means your minute volume can go down by a liter or a liter and a half in a minute. And so you're doing substantially less breathing, cuts down on your work of breathing, and makes it less likely that you're going to go down that spiral to respiratory failure. Uh, now, people with disease often have higher dead space ratios because they have areas within their lung par parenchyma uh, that is not exchanging gas and there's, therefore is, may contribute either to dead space if there's ventilation and no perfusion or shunt if there's perfusion and no ventilation. But uh, the high flow is not going to get at that. It, it doesn't correct the dead space caused by disease. But the anatomic dead space will remain the same whether your lung is diseased or not. I think that was part of your question. And you'll still have that per breath 50 to 75 cc's washout, which will still contribute to a reduction of work of breathing. Uh, Butterball the cat, uh, you know, the, it, it, I guess there's, there's a silly answer, which is uh, <laughs> like, like any normal cat, uh, Butterball, after I strapped that mask on, attacked me and left me with several <laughs> several large wounds. But uh, actually, um, veterinarians do use masks like that uh, with a little bit of anesthesia uh, to do you know procedures and and uh, work on these animals. And there's actually been use of non-invasive ventilation masks in cats. I, I don't have personal experience with that. <laughs> Um, I think we have time for um, one more question, and um, this question came from both um, Mark and Lisa, and the question pertains to one of the studies that you uh, reviewed. Why was standard BiPAP used as opposed to AVAPs on the V60? All right. Um, yeah, so... Um, we uh, th we did do that in in the study that we recently published, and the main reason was uh, w when we d designed this study, uh, AVAPS was just starting to be used. It actually wasn't available in, in uh, a number of our ventilators, and um, it it is and and still it, it is it was and still is really the you know the the mode that most people are using. Now, AVAPS is an interesting mode at, for people who aren't familiar with it. It's average volume assured pressure support. And what it enables you to do is target a certain tidal volume and, and you select a rate and therefore you're uh, guaranteed um, a, a more reliable minute ventilation, theoretically, uh, than if you start out with uh, a standard BiPAP. Um, you can achieve the same thing with standard bi BiPAP if you start out with relatively low pressures. You, you go back and you increase pressures to assure that you get a desired targeted tidal volume, and that's what we did in our study. Um, but AVAPs will do it more automatically, and so I think there is a potential role. Now, as far as evidence in the acute care setting, demonstrating to us that AVAPS actually is superior to properly adjusted BiPAP, there isn't any. Uh, there, there, I'm aware of one study on patients who came in with obesity hypoventilation and exacerbation, and the AVAPS group achieved a more rapid reduction in CO2, and patients woke up from their hypercapnic comas more rapidly than standard BiPAP. But when you looked at what they did, they they stacked the study against standard BiPAP because they started out with much higher potential pressures. You know, with, with uh, AVAPs, you put in a range, and they their range was like from 18 to 10 or something like that, and they rapidly got to their targeted volume. Whereas in the BiPAP group, they started out with something like 12 over 6 and just left it there. So uh, you had a much more effective BiPAP with AVAPs, if you will, and then uh, the standard BiPAP was not able to achieve the same uh, target because they didn't go back and increase the pressure. So, you know, I, th I think that as long as you use BiPAP properly and go back and increase the pressures to whatever target volume you, you want, it probably ends up working as well as, as AVAPs. 
Uh, because that's often not done, people get busy and they don't go back and up titrate. Uh, I think there are potential advantages to AVAPs. Thank you so much, John, Dr. Hill. Uh, this concludes uh, the presentation and question and answer period. At this point, I'd like to turn over the presentation back to Emily. I'd like to thank you very much for your time, both Dr. Hill, for this wonderful presentation, and as well to you, Kathy, for being our moderator today. It has been such a pleasure working with you both. And I'd like to thank each and every one of you, our guests in the live audience today, and as well those of you in a future time who are attending this recorded session. We thank you for your time and your thoughtful attention. And now this does conclude our session for today. Take care, everyone, and bye for now. We'll see you again next time.